Welcome to another episode of War Stories. I'm Tom. And I'm Chuck. And uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, once again, we have an author on the program, but an author who is also a first responder. Why don't you tell us about this week's guest, Chuck? Yeah, so uh, he wrote in. um, He is another another author. um, And it kind of jogged back to when we had the Fallen Tigers uh, author on, who was currently serving in the armed forces and was writing that great book or, or, right. or regarding those fighter pots um during a like world war uh two era and so we got another one on and this one strikes near and dear to my heart and i know it does as, as well as yours but my grandfather was you know um a fighter pilot and in a um a hump pilot in world war ii and you know got medals from china and things like that and so this gentleman's his his uh his grandfather um was a pilot and he So he uh, wrote a book about him and he also happens to be a firefighter. So I think it's cool. I think it's, it's great that we we keep having authors like this come on. Yeah. um, Because I want to write a book. It makes, yeah, (laughs) me too. Makes me feel like a slouch for not writing a book, (laughs) but it's great to hear about stories from people who went through this, right. When our grandparents went through this as well. And I never really got to speak to mine because he died so young. Um, so I think it's, it's great to start hearing some of these stories, you know, come out and, and to just hear about the history and, and, you know, all that stuff that was going on during those times. Well, welcome to the show, firefighter and author, Justin, how are you, sir? Good. Thank you guys for having me. Appreciate it. We're happy to, we're happy to. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself first? We'll start with, you know, your background and, and tell us as much as you want or can about, uh, where you work and, and, or at least what you do and how long you've been doing it and, and kind of, you know, as you know, from the show, what got you into it? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. So this is quite the, I guess the flow chart, if you can follow this, cause I've, I've done quite a bit, I guess, in, uh, free hospital settings and been really fortunate to do a lot of, a lot of different things. Um, I guess I originally, I'm, I'm living here in Phoenix, uh, just outside of Phoenix. And originally I, I started as an EMT working for a, a local detox facility. Uh, okay. where they'd send us out and we'd respond with like Phoenix PD and Phoenix fire about people that are just intoxicated or on drugs or, you know, something like that. And we'd uh, throw them in the back of our van and bring them back to this detox center. So it was a very kidnap them, and kidnap them to rehab. Yep. That's right. <laughs> they they okay. love that, man. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure they do. You yeah. know, I've seen how they react to Narcan. I can't imagine how kidnapping them into rehab goes over. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> yeah. But for, for there, like uh, from there, I, I, got my fire science stuff all figured out. I wanted to be a firefighter. I tried testing for like two years and nothing was going on. So my, my last what, what year was that? That was a uh, 2007. Six okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I, the last place I, I said, I'm going to do it one more time. And I got picked up there. I got lucky. I spent another four years working there at a place uh, along the I-10, uh, from Phoenix to LA, the I-10 that goes out there. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. It, at that time, when I got hired, it was kind of one of the deadliest uh, stretches of freeway in America. I don't know if it still is, but so we got really good on like traumas and a lot of interesting calls out in the middle of nowhere with minimal resources. Um, and it really, it was great to really uh, fine tune some of my skills. Um, yeah. So and they gave me the opportunity to go to paramedic school. I got on a different fire department after that. And this is kind of where it starts getting a little complicated is uh, and uh, 2000. 15, I, I, I left the department to go work as a flight paramedic for one of the local air ambulances. So oh, very did, cool. Yeah. I did rotor for about a year. I was just so fortunate. A lot of people kind of put their name on me and helped me through the process. And, you know, I hope to pay that back too. Um, well, everybody that listens to this show knows that I have a thing for helicopters, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Well, had that been something that you've always wanted to do was work on an, uh, an aircraft? Yeah. You know, uh, I'd love flight since I was little, uh, but when I started working at that first fire department out in the middle of nowhere, we'd, we'd call in a lot of the air ambulances and the helicopters out there. And I thought, wow, these guys know their stuff. You know, I want to, I want to be the best I can be. And someday I want to do that. And I just worked hard. I, I kind of kept my mouth shut and worked hard and went through the process and got lucky. Wow. Yeah. I it's anybody that's, 
I don't know. I feel like if you've ever been on a rotary wing aircraft, if you've been on a helicopter, it's, I don't know how you can't fall in love with it. It's, it's so much fun. Yeah. yeah I mean, absolutely. granted, I wouldn't, I, I don't necessarily want to take care of sick patients. We all know my relationship with being a medic is <laughs> sketchy at best, but you know, being on there working dope cases or working surveillances or doing all that kind of stuff. That's awesome. And flying the thing is going to be awesome too. Oh yeah. I bet. Yeah. Probably, so, uh, I, oh, go okay. ahead. No, I was just going to say it's, it's kind of a really unique experience. I know you, you kind of are, yeah. are in this bubble where you talk to a lot of people who get those opportunities, but kind of sit back and look at it. And like, these are some amazing things you get to take part in. Yeah. It's you, when you really take a, you really take that long view of the things you've done in your career. Sometimes you forget because, you know, as you know, you do anything for long enough and you get paid to do it. it it's a job, right? Mm -hmm. right? But then when you talk to other people and, you know, you, they, they, you find, you forget. And, and so through other people's eyes, sometimes you can remember just how amazing some of the stuff we get to do is. So that's, that's one of the things that's, it's nice about talking to other people. Also, you get to renew your love for it by talking to other people who have done it, who love it too. And then it gets you excited. Um, yeah. I, I just, I think it's cool. Now, when you were working in that remote area, right? So mm -hmm. I, I, I'm kind of drawing a picture in my mind. So I want to find out if I'm way off because I have a question then. Yeah. I see sometimes these, you know, super remote areas of the highway and, you know, it's way out in the middle of nowhere, like you're saying. And then you come across like a fire station that's out in the middle of nowhere. Right. Right. Yeah. Is that what we're talking about? Like just this lonely firehouse that's way out in the middle of nowhere and you're driving for an hour and a half to get to your fire station. And then you live there for a couple of days. I mean, is that what we're talking about? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, it was, it was a small community out there, a farming community, and they had a local uh, uh, natural gas power plant out there. So they wanted a, a fire department out there. And we were okay, the last sense. ones on the west side of town to like Quartzsite to the California. Border. Oh, I know where that is. That's way. Yeah. Yeah. So Quartzsite, like they have a, did they have like a rock and gem show there? Like a big swap meet type. Yeah. Thing they, or something? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, farmers yeah. markets and stuff. Yeah. I've been out. It's a crazy little town, but it is in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Like, sure. yeah. So, so you would stay there, live there. And how, how long was a rotation? How, how many days could you string together realistically? Uh, so that department and the one I'm at now, we do 48, 48 hours on, 96 hours off, two, two okay. days on, four days off, which is amazing, you know, especially being a fire, uh, father and having so much yeah. time off. So I'm very fortunate there. Yeah. That's, uh, as we've talked to a lot of people, we tell them, you know, you want to, that's a pretty good schedule. <laughs> Yeah. Oh yeah. It's a lot and better most, than a lot of the cop schedules. Yeah. Well, most firefighters really have to strive to like find a house that, that works with, with uh, firefighters like that. But I'm, I'm assuming just because of the remote location that it's just advantageous to work and have longer stretches off just because that drive would kill you if you had to do it multiple times. Absolutely. Oh God. Yeah. And, yeah. and I would think yeah. that can you, you now, can you string together? Cause I know um, there's bigger departments where I've talked to guys and they'll literally be stringing together nine or like 10 AFD? days. Yeah. They yeah. will string together nine or 10 days so that they can go home for like two weeks, three weeks. Is that something you guys could do? Or was that just not in the realm of possibilities? Uh, a lot of that is kind of just, uh, dependent on the, the organization you work for. Cause in, in like the Phoenix general area, there are all sorts of different things. There's a, you know, one day on two days off, two days on four days off. And there's some weird, what they call it, like a Kelly schedule, which is like a back and forth day on day off, day on day off. And then like five days off or something. So it, it just depends on, Ooh. on, on what, what that, that community needs. And it's, and it's kind of important to look at that because like, let's say Phoenix fire, for example, works a day on two days off. Like if those guys did 48 hours on the call volume that they get, they get burnt out so fast that oh yeah, right. that makes sense. That. you can't you, you wouldn't sleep for 48 hours. Right. And Tom, I think I know the, the, the agency, one of the agency, the agency you're talking about is LAFD to the firehouse is a very sleepy firehouse. And everybody that works at that firehouse lives out of state. Yeah. Oh, really? So they you're all always... have that same schedule, similar to where they have coverage on every day. Um, but they're all long stretches to have long stretches off. And I don't know what how, station house it was. I know um, 
this goes back to when I was working the road. Uh, I pulled over a young lady and she was, we, I mean, my, my city where I worked was good, a good 130, 40 miles outside of Los Angeles. Um, and the, so I pulled this gal over and the city where she lived was another 15 miles North of that. And she said her dad worked for LA fire. And I said, Oh, how often do you get to see him? She goes, well, you know, he's home. I'm like, wait, he lives with you. She goes, yeah, he works for, you know, nine or 10 days. And then he comes home for a month. I'm like, yeah, that's, it's, uh, that's insane. That's crazy. Yeah. So, that's a lot of time off. Yeah. It's a lot of time. Yeah. Off. But that's why, you know, those guys that firefighting is their other job. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, so. We send a lot of crews over to California for like all the wildfires and everything. And those guys are, you know, on campaigns and that's that, that beats you up. Yeah. You'll lose them for, yeah. you know, a couple of weeks, if not a month. And I mean, the overtime's good. Oh yeah. You know, the overtime's the overtime's fantastic. So you um, changed to the your are you still with the air ambulance now or uh, no? I so I did that a year and I missed the fire service. I missed like the camaraderie. I missed the schedule. Um, so I was I was slowly working myself to get back in, and that was kind of at the tail end of when we. I don't know how it worked for you guys out there, but we were kind of like on a huge firefighter hire freeze. So mm-hmm. I was kind of stuck in this limbo. And, and so from there, I, I was like, I always wanted to teach. I always wanted to teach EMT. So I, I worked for one of the local community colleges as a full-time instructor while I was getting back at the fire department I'm at now. Oh, okay. Wow. That's good. I mean, you know, teachings, that's one of the best ways you can get a better skill set at something you're trying to do is to teach it. It's amazing how quickly teaching will build up your own skill set. And it's a great thing to do while you're trying to get back onto a fire department. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I'm, uh, you know, I was fortunate to do that. I always wanted to be, kind of be a good mentor for people, whether it was a, with the fire department or as an instructor. And, and it was a great opportunity to do that. Uh, but in the end, I just wanted to get back on the, on the truck, you know, <laughs> it was, now what was it about that? Was it schedule? Was it actually firefighting was it the medical aids what what was it was it the whole i mean obviously the camaraderie you said but specifically when it comes to being a firefighter what draws you back to that i i know when i talk to cops now even as i'm retired i know what i could say to them i'm like these are the things i miss about the job i can also give them the things i don't miss about the job yeah for sure but what was it specifically and not just the camaraderie and and what but like the, the actual job duties yeah, sure. I, I know I hate to say it because it almost sounds cliche and it sounds like a kind of rehearsed interview kind of question for me, but I'd, I'd always even, I never grew up wanting to be a firefighter. I kind of discovered that in my early 20s and uh, thought it was kind of cool to jump on a truck and r- roll down the road with your lights on and all that. So, I was about to say, was it the lights and sirens? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. It is. Boys are boys, you know? Oh, yeah. Uh, that's what it is for me. But no, I always I thought, mean, like, oh, go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. You're always so wet. I was going to say, like, I, I, I grew up uh, just as cliche as it is, wanting to kind of help out and make a make a, a, um, a change in the community, help them out. And uh, I think especially I enjoy a lot of the medical side of things. And I think that was such a great way for me to be able to connect with the community. Right. Yeah, I I, I will definitely say that up on the list of things that I miss uh, rolling code. I mean, let's face it, you know, it's dangerous. It's scary. It's you know, sometimes terrible. I've seen fire trucks that roll code and tip over when they're making a turn. You know, I've seen all that stuff. I've seen cop cars. I had a friend who almost died wrapping his cop car around a, a light pole, go rolling code. I get it, but it's still yeah. fun. <laughs> it's oh, yeah. Still a good time. Yeah. I miss no, yelling at people. <laughs> uh, yeah. Because I've been out for such a long time. I miss uh, the lights and sirens. Um, and I miss uh, when I see shitty drivers. Being able to like, on my PA system. Whoop. No, I don't know if I can do that. I don't, <laughs> I don't want to have to, no, I don't want to have to lock that and hop on the PA system and tell them <laughs> they're stupid and tell them that he just messed up. And you know, I've gotten more praise for that in the area that I was working <clears throat> and basically doing someone out over a PA system then pulling them over and giving them a very expensive ticket, like running a stop sign or a light or something like that. And people right. would stop me and wave me down and be like, Hey, that was really cool. What you did, you made him feel stupid. And 
you got him to slow down because this is a neighborhood. We thank you. Like, I'm like, oh, cool. I am. I'm just being yeah, I was just having fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just, I didn't want to get out of my car. <laughs> yeah. It's more fun to yell at yeah. him than to ride a ticket. So, I, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, obviously chasing bad guys, arresting, taking actual bad guys to jail. I'm sure there's elements of like going into a, you know, a fire, or, like fighting an actual fire. Not, maybe not, you know, maybe not scooping old ladies off the toilet when they pass out, but, you know, <laughs> like actually fighting a fire, you know. The yeah. glamorous the side hot, of the job. By the way. Yeah. Fuck. You don't realize how hot, hot fire is until you until get, you're like, in one. Right. Like, yeah. So a lot of guys like you guys were working PD side, like you a lot of times I would suspect that you'd be first on scene, even beating fire department there, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Mm, I beat fire no. department there quite a few times. Well, see, our guys always had to make wake no. up. Like they were never running call to call to call. And so <laughs> Quite often, I'd like to work in graveyard shift. And so if a fire happened, a lot of our residential fires didn't happen in the day. They happened at night, you know, chimney fires, things like that. So, yeah, I'd get there and I'd be first. And whew, hot. there's only been a hot fire. handful of times that I've been able to call a fire in. And there's been a few times that I've beaten FD to. Uh, a fire whether it be like a big ass brush fire or whatever just because i was already in the location in the area and i already saw it and i was like hey you know is there a call in this area they're like yeah i'm like put me on it and i would start you know getting people out or locking down areas but most of the time like 95 percent of the time fd was always beating us there and there was only one time i was actually stuck inside of a fire protecting fd as they're protecting us from the fire like it was it was yeah. wild no kidding yeah. and that sucked that was hot. I always hate yeah. the fact that my damn uniform and I smell like smoke and fire for like two days after. Like it's it's so bad that now, like when I've been around a campfire, I got to take a shower before I go to bed because I just I have grown to loathe the smell of fire on myself. It's yeah. it's the it's the weirdest thing. So tell us a little bit about working in the area where you work, like what kinds of things do you see? It's your, your story, please. I want to, I want to jump into this stuff about your, uh, about your grandfather, but I don't want to miss out on some of these great firefighter stories. Cause you guys sometimes come with the best ones, you know, some EMTs and firefighters have given us such famous uh, tales as the lobster claw and the uh, wood chipper stories. So I, I would, I can't wait to hear some more. Yeah, I guess there's there's no end to crazy, right? Like it's job security for for all of us. But right. um, yeah, so um, I guess I guess after that, I I kind of went back, got back in the fire service, and uh, like I said, it's a little convoluted how this all goes. But 2018, I think it was. I uh, I I was we were doing a lift assist, a lady from a wheelchair onto her bed, and uh, I blew out my back, I herniated my back, I herniated Ooh. a disc in my neck. And uh, so obviously I was, I was out for, for quite a while. I ran out of short-term and long-term disability, I ended up having to resign. Um, oh yeah. So it just kind of, kind of sucks. So I took the next year thinking like, do I want to try to get this disability? Do I want to do surgery? And I knew that was kind of going to be a game ender. So I literally took it up to the, the week before I had that disability claim to be able to file. And I was like, I can't do this. I want to get back, but it took me a good year to get pain-free and it sucked, especially like you guys talk about being a parent, like it sucks to turn your head around and try to back your car yeah. up or pick up your kids. Oh yeah. Pain, pain, terrible. Like it, chronic pain is terrible. I've got some neck and back stuff, you know, left over from all that. It's just, it's the worst, especially sometimes what people don't understand is there's the pain, but then there's also like the numbness when, when things start to go tingly on you that suck, you know, yeah. your, your, your hands start to tingle because your neck's messed up. <laughs> yeah. And I actually, I knew a firefighter who went through what you did. He injured himself in a Jeep accident, right? But it was off duty, right? And oh, so yeah. he ran out, out he ran out of his time. He ran out of catastrophic donated leave. He, re, he had to resign. And then it took him, you know, another year. To, so he had a year of, of being out on sick and all that and then it took him another year so it was two years before he got back in the saddle and he had to go to another agency because his own agency didn't have a spot for him anymore oh yeah 
yeah, it's, it's rough on guys, you know, and, but it's, it's funny. Like you, you just can't, it's like a beacon. You can't get away from it. There's people like that that are just so dedicated and driven that they'll do whatever needs to be done to get back. Yeah. Well, he made it to chief eventually at his new agency. So I, I think it worked out pretty well for him. Like, yeah. So. so you're wow. back, you're back now. Yes. Yeah. Went, came back about uh, two years, two years ago and uh, got back in and, uh, you know, I, I, luckily I didn't lose my public safety retirement and everything. That was kind of a big thing that, you know, well, I don't know how it is with you guys, but like if, if we were out of, of, of a public safety job for two years, we'd lose all that retirement. And by this point, you know, with 11 years in the public safety retirement system, like I couldn't, I just couldn't leave that, you know? Uh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Lose it. Does that sound? Yeah. Well, you have no, to. No, ours, you, if you're vested, the, the, it freezes. Mm -hmm. And then when you turn the appropriate age, they un unfreeze it and pay you out for whatever you've accrued. Mm, okay. So it doesn't matter. Once you're vested, that's yours. You don't, it doesn't matter. Like my oh. buddy left the department after 12 years or 13 years, he froze his retirement. He'll turn 50 in, I think, four years or six years, maybe. And then he'll be able to collect on his 12 years worth of retirement that he's accrued. Yeah. See, mine's like mine's like Justin's. It's if you don't, you see, you don't get vested until twenty, and that's retirement, right? So they did away with the whole ten year thing, and so it's, it's only 20, twenty and out for you, right? So if you serve 10, 11, 12, 14, 15, 18, 19 years, <clears throat> and you get a catastrophic, you know, injury, and you're you're out, and you can't stretch it to that twenty, you don't get to freeze anything, and if you have to leave, and you don't, uh, you don't go for a medical pension. You lose everything except wow. for the money that you've paid into that you can pay you out on it at a tax rate. Yes. Right. Yes. So they that's pay you out crazy. on all that. Yeah. It's, it's wild. And that's why, that's why I'm going through medical pension right now. Like, right. The, the chances of me going back to work with a messed up knee and just had surgery on my back. And you have to that, have another one. Yeah. I'm, I have to have another one, probably a knee replacement. It's wow. just not feasible. So I'm like, you know, screw it. I'm going to go through the medical pension process, which in its own right is a pain in the ass. And it's very scary. It's you lose money, all this craziness, but it's either you do that or you lose all your time. You have to try to do whatever, hope that you get better and then try to go back. And if they'll even take you, which they probably wouldn't with an injury that that severe. No. Right. You know, but if you're like, oh, hey. I'm going to come back. Yeah, I'm still hurt, but I'm going to come back through like, okay, cool. Which doesn't make any sense because now you're a, a firefighter safety issue. You're an officer safety issue because your if your back goes out or your knee blows out completely and you cannot move that limb or those limbs, you are, <laughs> you are a danger to yourself and to other people. Yeah. And we put people on hold for that type of shit. And granted, it's not mental, it's but it's physical. And if you're knowingly going to put yourself in danger as well as your partners, I mean, that is, that's dangerous as shit, you know? So it's, it's, it's wild, but I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Just like the whole, you know, if you don't, you're going to lose all that money. Like, like, and then you're kind of stuck in this weird predicament, you know, do I go get the surgery and medically retire or do I try to get better and go back and just kind of bite the bullet for a year after two years of being out? You know what I mean? Yeah, sure. That's a big, scary thing. Actually, I actually have a friend Sounds like that I work with now who went through that very thing where he got in a, a DUI collision, not him. Like he got hit by a drunk driver. He was, he had been on the job three years. He wanted to get back on the job and he so he thought you know when my body gets better i'll get back on the job so he had to resign and his body never got better and he could never get back on the job no no justin in that time that you're off with your back being all messed up and that year of trying to heal and get back to work which i'm assuming was a span of three years before you could actually get back into a firehouse uh so yeah it was well it was about a little over two years till i i was able to to function and and pass all the physicals and everything to get back in obviously it needed a lot of clearance to, to get back in. And, um, uh, it just all, all kind of worked out. There was, there were, to be honest with you, there were times I kind of, like you talked about biting the bullet and, uh, kind of pushing through. Uh, but, uh, that was a big thing. Like I didn't want to, I didn't want to be that liability on the crew. So if I'm coming right. back, I want to be good to go. Right now, what were you doing for, for keeping your head right during that time? Money, 
and, you know, um, just supporting your family. What, what were you, what were you able to do during that time? Yeah. So, so luckily I didn't burn a lot of bridges with the, like the, the college. So I went back to teaching uh, right. okay. that, that kind of really helped me out for, for quite a while there. Um, uh, so it was good times, you know, I was just, I, I kind of tried to, I was so depressed about losing that, that career, that profession, you know? And uh, so, but I, I, I really kind of worked on switching all that mentality around and making, you know, there's a positive, there's a change, there's something that I need to, to deal with to move forward here or I can wallow in my sorrows. And uh, I just think it was, a, it was, something was meant to be, you know? Right. Right. So do you think that by going back and teaching, it helped you mentally? Yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah, it, it, it was definitely a good thing to kind of keep me busy, keep my mind busy. And, and one of the big things is obviously teaching, we, we teach a lot of anatomy and physiology and disease processes and all right. that. Um, but a, a big thing that I really liked uh, including in, and really focusing on is like the, the, uh, the un, unseen uh, injuries. That, that a lot of the first responders, ENTs and firefighters are going to go through. So when we're talking to like these 18, 19 year old kids that are all about like the, the glamor of the job and getting that shirt and getting that billboard on your back, you know, I was, I really wanted to emphasize there's a lot more to that and you got to really watch yourself. Yeah. Right. Cause I know for myself and I'm pretty sure I can speak for Tom on this, but I know for myself and other people who I've spoken to who are out injured for a prolonged period of time, the depression gets real. Yep. real quick like you start kind of sometimes spinning out like you're like oh i'm good i'm good i'm good and boom you spin out and you don't even know you're spinning out until you're kind of like it's kind of late and you're like oh shit it's been like uh, all these things have been leading up to it i have actually been spinning out this whole time and it's it's been a as a big mental struggle when you're out injured you know because it whether it be you're not able to do things with the family or you're not able to have a normal functional life like it's cool to take that break for a little bit but once that break kind of wears off from the day-to-day -day, you know shit that you're dealing with at work and your mind's like all right i've had enough break but body's still messed up right. that depression sets in really quick and it gets real strong real fast guys get overweight mm -hmm. um they get out of shape Mm -hmm. you know happened to me and i'm still trying to get yeah. off the, the the depression weight from when i went through retirement and that was 10 years ago <laughs> and drinking gets real oh yeah for sure well we're yeah. going to talk about that on locker rooms but um it 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 it's such a multifaceted thing and we're trained to be you know i'm good but not only as first responders but as as people and especially you know for the three of us being men but so men people in general and then first responders were trained to say things like yeah it sucks but i'll be good you know i'm i, I you know yeah i'll be all right i'm fine and you're con you're convincing yourself as much as you're convincing everybody else because you're I, I remember thinking i'm 35 years old i should not be like staring down starting a an all-new career over again i was expecting to do this till i was 55 you know and what the hell so, and you see your buddies moving on and you lose a lot of your friends and, you know, it, it's still, it's still a bummer sometimes. So I get it. Yeah, you sure find out who of, your friends are. Oh, for sure. Oh, yeah. you find out yeah. your friends yeah. are. It kind of makes me think of that, that statistic or, or the, uh, the, I guess how people, especially firefighters and PD officers, once they retire, like the, the likelihood of them dying or suicide within like, it was like five or seven years. It just, it spikes and it's just ridiculous because uh, um, you know, how, in, like you talk about, you get so invested that in, in that lifestyle, in your friends. And then when you're kind of go cold Turkey you kind of mess up a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, uh, what are some of the things like, what are your, some, some of your most memorable moments? Um, but what are some of the things that stick out to you? I mean, obviously you're still working, right? So you're still making those moments, but, uh, with, whether it's uh, working out in the middle of nowhere or, you know, being on the, the air ambulance crew, I'm sure you've had some, some pretty memorable moments that you can share with our audience. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for sure. Like um, I know working out uh, in that, that first apartment I was, I was at in the middle of nowhere. You said we get a lot of MBAs, um, motor vehicle accidents and collisions out there. So we got really good at that type of trauma um, and then seeing some really, really crazy things like show, pulling up on scene and trying not to run over somebody's amputated arm, you know, out there, kinda, 
yeah, it's, uh, it's that thing you kind of joke afterwards about like good driving guy. Like, yeah. But, um, seeing weird stuff like that. Uh, I work for a different community now that worked for an, actually it worked for an Indian community. Um, and, uh, uh, they have so like same. on a reservation on, on yeah. Indian ter- territory. So it's like tribal, tribal fire. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Cool. The different kind we of have aspect. a tribal police department real close to us actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So how, yeah. how's that? Like what kinds of things do you see different things on the res than you would then see maybe off? Yeah, for sure. I'd say like I went from trauma at that other place being like the main focus of our calls to now all medical, because obviously there's a lot of disease processes that affect that, that, that population in general. But the other thing that we get is a lot of people from like Sun City and that one, older people that want to come out to the casino. So we get a lot of medical calls. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's, it's definitely a different world. And then you add in the cultural aspect in it too. You know, you're a, you're an ambassador for the community, even though you're not a member of that community, you're still wearing their billboard on your back. Right. And Uh you're, it's your people are going to expect that you're representing them, even though you you're not one of them just by virtue of the fact that you've got that patch on your shoulder and that badge on your chest. Yeah. That makes sense. Is that, is that near Parker? Uh, no, no, uh, actually that's, that was close to where my uh, air ambulance was out there. So, yeah, but, we're about um, 20 minutes south of Phoenix, where the department's on at right now. Yeah. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, call volume's okay. good, and, you know, we're not going home fried all the time, so I, that's, that's a good thing. Um, I, uh, we definitely come up with some, some interesting calls there. We get a lot of different people from uh, people that are doing, trying to create meth labs in the casino room, in the hotel Wait, rooms what? there. What, yeah, what, they, what? They, they bring crap and we, we, we showed up on one and uh, there was all sorts of crap in the, uh, the bathtub and the bathroom. And I think obviously they, uh, not surprisingly, they were having some sort of cardiac issue. So we go in there and we kind of saw a lot of this paraphernalia, uh, a lot of um, things that kind of turned out to be almost like a hazmat type of situation. Oh yeah, for sure. Situation. Yeah. Um, but that on that specific call, I remember that we're, we're treating this patient and, um, we, there are about four of us that go in the hotel room. The captain's kind of standing behind us and he's kind of leaning up against this dresser behind him. And uh, everybody on the crew sees what's behind him on the top of the dresser, except for the captain. And he just has a, an arm propped up there. And behind him are like this array of sex toys. Like, <sighs> of course. Huge, yeah. Dildo, like a rubbery dildo up there. Yep. And so flashlights. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he's like what? leaning there and it's shaking and like everybody's trying not to crack up because like captain's oblivious about this stuff. And uh, it was just, it was an amazing experience. Yeah. The, the, the oh, sex toy yeah. thing is real. Yeah. <laughs> that, that reminds me of a funny story of a burglary gone wrong and it was a lover's quarrel and the two guys who lived in the house were uh, partners. And so they lived there. <laughs> right. And okay. I guess the guy's old partner had gotten mad that he was with the new partner and broke into the house, smashed the back window, destroyed the interior of the house. But he did so with a big a very large girthy <laughs> suction cupped dildo <laughs> and broke shit in the house with it. Come to find out it was actually the two gentlemen who lived there. It was their toy. So the, the old ex scorned, scorned lover went into their bedroom, destroyed their bedroom, found it, destroyed their house with it and then left it on the, the floor and now it's evidence so we're all there and we're trying to put this together and we're like what the fuck why is there a big like glistening dildo in the Did center and glistening one guy yes so one of the <laughs> one of the cops picks it up and it is glistening with this shiny some substance i'm assuming lubricant with hair stuck to it oh <laughs> and he's like he gets to carry it and it's flopping all over and he doesn't want to grab it by the shaft. Right. So he's holding it by the, the very edge of the suction cup. Right. And it's flopping all back and forth. 
And yes, we have to go and try to keep a straight face mm-hmm. and talk to the homeowners. And I'm like, I'm not primary on this. I'm like, I'm just going to stand back and, and watch and laugh. Yeah, with your gag and, reflex, I'm sure you yeah. didn't want to touch that. Well, thing. this thing was like, what the, what the? And you're like, <laughs> is this yours or did the suspect break in with it and destroy your house with it? And this thing's shaking all over. And they're like, they're embarrassed. They're like, that's actually ours. And then they go through this whole story of, I think we know who it is. And they lay out the whole like lover's triangle of the score and lover. And I'm like, Oh, that makes 100% yeah. sense. It was a, it was it a was message. Just, it's so funny that that was that the how, horse's head in their bed. <laughs> it, only it wasn't a horse's head and it wasn't in their bed. Floor. Luckily the kid didn't go in and see that. Um, Cause they had a young child uh, that lived there. Um, it's so weird that in law enforcement and fire that how often we see like Hello. crazy sex toys and objects and, <laughs> In the strangest circumstances, uh, I did it. I I hit a house once, and um, the people on the house were laying on the floor, naked under a blanket, not in bed, like on the living room floor. And of course, we you know we are about to cuff them up, and one of them needed to be taken to the bathroom because they had fallen asleep with something inserted inside of themselves. Mm. Yeah. And so we couldn't we we, had, we didn't want to take it out for them so we had to escort them to the bathroom so they could remove it and then they could be handcuffed which is always fun now this whole time you seemed pretty busy with with work and injuries and recovering and teaching when did you find time to write a book yeah funny right right then in 2018 i had that it's funny because i had that back injury on september 11th 2018 kind of ironic, oh, right? Right. Um, but in December, I started writing that book. It's 2018, I started writing that book. So coming up on this December, it's been like a, almost a four-year process. And I, I just discovered some really amazing things from for our family and and uh, even on a, on a bigger uh, um, schedule as well. Wow. Okay. And that book, what does it entail in its entirety? Uh so uh, it's really pretty much about my grandfather and a little bit about my grandmother, uh, both of whom, like kind of like you, they, they passed before I was born. My grandmother actually died when I was, uh, I was not even one yet, so I never really knew him. And my grandfather was completely estranged from the family, kind of abandoned them in the 60s. So my mother and her brothers had a very limited knowledge of who their dad was. And, and when he was around, he was kind of an asshole, you know, and, and a lot of that stuff came from his World War II experiences. Um, so I, I did a lot of research. I found uh, some of our family that we didn't even know existed because he had, he had kind of taken off. Um, and then a lot, of, a lot of really interesting stories. So he, uh, he flew B-17 bombers in World War II. He was a crop duster before the war, so he loved flying. He wanted to be a fighter pilot, kind of like your, your grandfather, right? That, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, but they put him on bombers, put him, put nine guys under his command and they went over to England and on their third mission, they had a mid-air collision with another bomber in their formation. The other bomber broke in half and all, uh, nine of those guys were killed, just died. Uh, but my grandfather, uh, the bombardier on, on his plane was killed almost immediately, kind of bled Oof. out. And then there was a, another guy that ended up having a, a really bad head injury and he ended up passing too. But they hit so hard that all nine people on that aircraft were knocked out. And it actually blew my grandfather's gloves off, blew his helmet down. It broke open the cockpit. So they immediately lost their oxygen supply and they were at 27,000 feet. So it was an immediate frostbite on his, his hands uh, and nose and, and ear. And what so, kind of a plane? What model? Uh, B-17. The, the Fortress. B-17 yeah, flying. flying Fortress. Mm-hmm. So they're up at 27,000 feet in the B-17? Yeah. Yeah. And he, so he, he they're just wearing all the leathers and the oxygen masks and all that stuff. And man, I just like, I know, I know you get up there in a B 17, but I guess I just didn't, it didn't occur to me that you'd be up like that high in a B 17. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, not, not what two years before that they were flying with open, open windows in the back of the aircraft. Like these gunners in the back of the aircraft were having like their hands freeze to their machine guns. Yeah. So bare hands, you know, and frostbite yeah. was a big, uh, uh, big disabler back then. I just looked wow. it up. It has a ceiling of 35,000 feet. Mm. Well, I, I would okay. never have guessed. I would yeah. never have guessed that. Cause th- I mean, that plane is not sealed. 
right? Of, it's not right, pressurized. Yeah, not. It's damn. Ooh. I mean, I I know you said B17 and you're like 27,000 feet. I'm a what plane? <laughs> yeah, I know. Kind of gives you perspective, you know, flying an airliner nowadays and looking like, holy well, cow, these guys are up there. Just think about the guys who are flying, like, because my grandfather was a hump pilot. So he had to fly across the Chinese, Burmese, or China and Burmese mountains over the top. And how many people, which we learned in the last author, one of the last authors we had on for the Flying Tigers, so many pilots were lost on that that transportation route and you had to fly so high like they were constantly losing guys into the mountains and probably frostbite whatever they were losing them to um but flying so high in these old now would be rickety planes mm. right that's some scary shit right there and these these pilots were doing it frequently yeah you know yeah what else was he what else did he do uh so while he was a pilot yeah so so after that um i should say they they he ended up uh knocking some engines out on his plane and they ended up uh he put it into a stall and kind of brought it back down to about five thousand feet but he did it without using his hands and oh, he shit. also had some sort of internal well yeah because his hands were like free freezing at that point yeah 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 so he uh he somehow got it down there and a couple of the guys jumped out were captured by the germans and uh, he ended up keeping the plane in the air for another hour. He was trying to make it out to France to get to friendly lines, but he actually uh, flew the plane almost directly into uh, an uh, Luftwaffe airfield, and they shot him down. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. So they they crashed, um, and the locals, the local Germans, came out and actually helped the crew out, they bandaged some of their wounds. They they actually helped them out of the burning plane. Oh, and, well, that was uh, nice of them, I guess. Yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of interesting because like that was we a are going to bandage state. your wounds and then take it to the stalag. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's like no. Hogan's heroes and shit or or great escape. Yeah. Did he did he end up getting taken prisoner? Yeah. So the yeah, the Germans showed up a couple minutes after after that, and they actually uh um summoned some of the local Germans for interrogation by the Gestapo the next day because they had been helping the enemy, you know, made in contact with the enemy. And so he was taken to a, a POW camp. And the rest of the crew that survived were sent to a hospital because they had broken bones as well and frostbite injuries. But he, I guess, pissed off his interrogator somehow, and they shipped him down to a permanent POW camp. And at this point, he uh, his hands were starting to uh, suffer from such severe frostbite that he was getting septic, he was getting like septic shock, got extremely sick, he was on the verge of death. And the POW camp thought he was like a lost case and pretty much wrote him off and said, okay, we'll finally send him to the hospital. So he went three weeks without any care on his frostbite injuries. And he ended up losing most of the fingers on his right hand, uh, the tip of his nose, the tip of his ears. It was pretty gnarly. Oh. Damn. Yeah. Look, talk about the PTSD that that man endured. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And like I said, uh, for the longest time, we didn't know. Like I grew up knowing my grandfather had PTSD and he had a survivor's guilt. And uh, right. all we really knew of him coming home is like he he was he was on the the on a mission to kill himself. He wasn't suicidal, but he was ready to go. He's ready. He to was die. just self destructive. Yeah, right. Like to the point of I'll do anything as long as it hurts. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Gotten uh, car accidents. He he raced cars. He raced uh, motorcycles. Gotten some boat accidents. Um, and, uh, became dependent on alcohol, um, and ended up doing a bunch of different jobs and kind of disappearing, uh, and died in 1976. Wow. But yeah, I, I didn't want to pass over the PTSD thing. Cause like, that was an important thing for me as a, as a firefighter, because I had struggled with some really interesting stuff in 2012, 2013, that, that are still obviously with me as you guys know how it goes. Uh, right. but it. I have such an appreciation for, for people to have to go through that, especially our veterans. Yeah. Well, I mean, the PTSD is interesting. I mean, I know we talk about it plenty of times on the show, but it's, it has never not been a thing. I can only imagine that like the only time the, the Romans would have had PTSD, the, the Celts would have, everybody would have had some form of it, you know, the people coming home from battle and just being different, you know, um, they, 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 just thinking of the phrase, he has seen war, you know, the thousand yard stare, all these things we talk about, but you've had shell shock, right? War weariness, battle fatigue, 
um, I think the most recent stress. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the most stress. recent one that I've think th- I, I, the, before post-traumatic stress disorder, the first one I heard that was getting close to the word stress. And it's funny. Cause I just saw this on an eighties TV show um, where one of the characters was a Vietnam veteran and he was having some issues and somebody looks at him as well, man, man, you're having delayed stress. He's like, I know all about delayed stress. It's not delayed stress. And I'm like, oh man. So they've every every war, every cycle, every iteration of veteran evolved. has has evolved this these different names. And you know, we've always known about it. It's just been hard to really, you know, define until now, I guess. Or maybe we're better at defining it as a medical diagnosis now, which is probably a better way to say it. They knew what it was. It was just he's all fucked up from the war. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah it's still sure. a very tab it's still a very taboo subject i mean you have firefighter and cops who definitely have ptsd or some form of post-traumatic stress and it's so frowned upon to even acknowledge it inside of that community while working and you have so many suicides that happen and so many alcoholic uh incidents that happen that are probably a good amount of them are all brought on by PTSD and it's just so frowned upon and no one wants to acknowledge it, but we've been acknowledging it for vets that have gotten out and things like that. And it's crazy because the, I know a lot of cops and firefighters are like, well, I was never in the military, never went to war or I was in the military, but I didn't see anything. But yet then you look at your whole experience while as a firefighter, or a police officer, and that is a whole different beast, right? And you look at cops like they're deploying every day if mm-hmm. they're in really shitty areas and neighborhoods. Yeah. You get mul- cops are getting in multiple shootings in their career. You, you used to hear the the whole thing as a, as law enforcement. You know, oh, when I was a cop, I never had to pull my gun out. You have agencies pulling out their gun every day, multiple times per day, and then you have fights happening, and then you have you know. Um, seeing all the carnage of people getting hurt and killed. And th- that is even more so on the FD side of just the carnage of, of injuries and self-destruction that you see, whether it be a domestic violence victim, a drunk driver who destroys a whole family and you have to see all of that, or a child who drowned or a crazy uh, parent who killed off their kids, right? And then you have fire and police that are dealing with that. And it's foolish to think that those people don't struggle for some from some type of PTSD. It is definitely PTSD. And you have agencies that fail to acknowledge it. And they're they're so they stand off as soon as someone's like, you know, I think I have this. They're like, oh, oh, well, you can't do the job, yada, yada, this and that. And then they leave them alone to their own accord. And then you have people who kill themselves. Like it's yeah. wild. Well, it's so, so we we've gotten to a point where I think people view like a PTSD diagnosis as you are mentally unstable. Right. And that's not like both the people that, <clears throat> that like in their in, in military police fire administrators that are dealing with it with their employees, but also the coworkers and the people who are diagnosed. Like when you get put out with, you know, you get diagnosed for PTSD. Guess what? I, I would be willing to bet when you get diagnosed with PTSD, you're going to end up on a fitness for duty, right? You're going to get an evaluation, period, end of story. Now, what happens after that evaluation is anybody's guess, right? It depends on your agency. It depends on how they handle it. it depends on the severity of the case. But getting diagnosed with PTSD and then subsequently being put out on a fitness for duty makes you feel like just that diagnosis alone makes everybody think that you're mentally unstable. and. That is that is a gross misrepresentation and gross misunderstanding. I think of what PTSD is. Does are there people who suffer from PTSD that become mentally unstable? Absolutely. But there are that's so because many... it goes untreated for such right. a long time. Right. Like my a guy I served with committed suicide and he couldn't do it, so he had the police do it and right. suicide by cop, and he was struggling for years, and we all saw it. But we just thought he was an alcoholic and he was fucking stupid, right? And that's what happened when we were in the military. Like people were like, oh, he's just a piece of shit. He's an alcoholic. He just can't get his shit together. No, he's gone through like five tours 
was in the invasion of Iraq. He was in the first push. He was on a combat engineer, um, you know, battalion. We did like three or three tours with them in Iraq and then did another, I want to say one or two with, with the Amtraks and Corcoran was struggling with such a bad PTSD while he was in. And I think he was like eight or 10 or 12 years, something like that was such a, suffering for so long for at least four years. Cause I was in for four and he was struggling the whole time. And he had already been busted down before I'd gotten there. So he'd probably been struggling for five to six years of PTSD, but no one could recognize it. And no one knew what he was. He just thought he was a piece of shit and he would get himself together. And then he would tank down again. And then he ultimately get it, you know, let go than other than honorable mm-hmm. discharge from the Marine Corps. And he was struggling for such a long time and he was fighting those demons so long while he was out. And I don't know what happened, but something triggered and he ended up losing it and did suicide by cop. And, you know, and to think that that could have all been prevented is so sad and is such Mm -hmm. a big downfall in the military. And that's in modern day military. And I, you know, guys like, like your, your grandfather were struggling with shit like that. And so they didn't know what it was, or they definitely didn't recognize it. And the guys were coming home destroyed you know didn't talk about it i mean there was that 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 um that thing with uh the was it an article where a guy was 90 years old and he was finally opening up about ptsd and losing all his buddies in world war ii yeah you know and that's a long you time. have stuff like that and <laughs> that's it, a fucking it opens, long time. Yeah. right and it opens my eyes because you're talking about with your grandfather my grandfather opened my eyes to my grandfather how he was basically killing himself with alcohol cigarettes oh shitty foods granted he was able to hold down a decent job i mean dude was fucking smart he became a botanist and he still worked for the military which is probably his only saving grace he kept himself busy but his home life i know from speaking with my dad i know from speaking with my aunts it was rough being with him it was rough living with him because he was just an asshole right and but he was so good to me and it was he would because i was the only person that wouldn't judge him Right. And I would be able to, he would just be able to sit there and not talk to me and just build shit like model airplanes, like the, all the ones that he flew, the Mustangs, the, the bombers, the, the transport planes, all that crazy shit, because he was able to, I'm able therapy. to look at it now. I'm like, it was therapy for him. And I'm not going to judge him because I right. can't, cause I'm too little. Like I'm seven, eight yeah. years you old. You were a safe human that he exactly. could. Yeah. I I'll tell you this. And one of the reasons that coming all the way back to when I first started coming up with the ideas for this show, I met my wife's grandfather, uh, my, my wife's great grandfather, I should say. He was uh, a Marine in World War II, Guadalcanal, Battle for the Pacific, Darvation Island, two Purple Hearts, shot, patched up, went back, shot again, patched up, went back again, right? That's, that was Bob Milburn. Rest in peace, Bob. Um, Bob to when I met him was in his nineties and Bob would sit in his recliner in his cowboy boots with a 30, a loaded 38 revolver in his magazine rack. And he didn't, he didn't like a lot of people. He didn't socialize with a lot of people. He loved, 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 he was terrible to his kids. He was an alcoholic. He had, you know, had a seizure one time due to, you know, over drinking in the middle of the driveway in front of his family. Like it was terrible. PTSD, he got to be, you know, in his 70s, 80s, 90s, he kind of recovered to the extent that you can, which is to say he just mellowed out, right? Retired, mellowed out, wife died, just kind of started living that quiet, you know, life of reflection. But he still didn't talk to a lot of people, even his son and his grandson, but he loved my wife, his great granddaughter. And she brought me home and introduced me to her great grandfather he found out I was a cop and she told me that his demeanor towards me instantly was different. Now her, her dad's not a veteran. Her dad's not a cop. Her dad's not a first responder. Her grandfather, not a veteran, not a cop, not a first responder. Didn't go to war. Didn't see human misery. Didn't see human suffering. I come in and everybody in the family says he's real. like, he likes you a lot. And he started opening up to me. He started telling me stories about Guadalcanal and Starvation Island and some of the shit that they saw there. And I would tell him cop stories and he would tell me Marine stories. And my wife was going, he doesn't, he doesn't do this with anyone. And I told her, I said, it's because he knows like 
it, it's okay to tell somebody who's been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Like if you deal with human misery for a living, you know, you, you're cool. You're like, I can tell you stuff and you can tell me stuff and we can, it's that exchange, right? You, if you want to get these moments out of me, you got to be able to give me something in return so that I know I'm not being judged. I know that the, the trauma that I've, it's, it's like trading trauma for trauma. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that brings me to my question for you, Justin, is you as a firefighter and air ambulance running over severed arms, you know, you've experienced trauma, right? Yeah. Did, can you speak to how writing this book, did it help you trade, like trade trauma with your grandfather and kind of understand him and at the same time, understand yourself? Did, how was, was the, was the process therapeutic at all? Yeah, it's, it's funny that you, you say that because it makes me, makes me think back, reflect on this a little bit. And I um, hadn't really thought too much about that, but I think it, it was really, there was a catharsis that kind of happened with this, not only like discovering more of our family, but having that connection with a man I'd never met, you know? Right. Um, and, and while I don't, I don't compare what I'd gone through to anything that he experienced, uh, like you said, you, you kind of get a little bit of a feeling, you kind of get a little bit of appreciation or at least an understanding of why somebody is like they are. And when my grandfather died, his legacy was he abandoned his family. He was an, an asshole. He was an alcoholic. And yeah, that's true. But he was also so much more, you know, so I think doing this research has, has really kind of opened that up, not only for my family, but it has has helped me out a lot. So it's funny you mentioned that. To process kind of, because that's one thing to the outsider looking in, your grandfather was a fucking asshole. Mm -hmm. yep. He was an alcoholic. He was abusive, probably verbally, if not physically, right? Yeah. I, I don't know. I'm, and then I, my grandfather was abusive physically and verbally, and he was an alcoholic. And he, I mean, my mom told me all the, the shit that he did when he was drinking and he t basically turned into a dry drunk. He was sober for 30, 33 years when he died, you know? Um, but that wasn't the guy I knew, right? I had the privilege of knowing him till I was 20 years old, not 19 years old. And that wasn't the guy, that wasn't the guy I knew, but for me going back in hindsight and looking at, the things that I've experienced and then the ways he was reacting and the things, I mean, the guy almost jumped out of a plane without a parachute because the plane got hit and he, he's like, he jumps out of the bombardier spot. He's like, we're going down. And he goes to jump out of the plane and he feels a hand jerk him back into the aircraft. And he turns around and he looks and so the radio operator had grabbed him and yanked him back in. He was out the door. No kidding. And he goes, what are you doing? What are you doing? We got a band. He goes, not without your fucking parachute, Bill. <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, and then subsequently, the pilot was able to limp the plane home and they didn't have to abandon. But like, these are the moments of crazy shit, right? But he was 16. Yeah. 17 years yeah. old. Yeah. And Which so crazy because you think about all these dudes who, like my grandfather, who by the time he was what 20, he had already been to war. He had already seen the nasty shit of war and was now in college with all these young kids. And when he was their age, he was fighting in a fucking war even younger than, than they were. Yeah. Most of these kids all went there. They're 16 years old and leaving for war. And by the time they get ready to go to college, they're with a bunch of kids and they're fucking grown ass men. Like just, let's just face it. They have seen some shit that most people will never ever experience in their life or come close to it. Right. Sure. I, I'll tell you this. If you don't think that if you have a hard time understanding post-traumatic stress, if you have a hard time understanding what the, the veterans the from Vietnam back, cause let's like, okay, we have in the last 20, 30 years, years developed a much greater understanding of post-traumatic stress disorder made leaps and bounds of it, worth of progress that a lot of it is due to looking at the vietnam war the korean war world war one world war two the, these these previous conflicts civil war oh my god civil war you know 
So when you look back in hindsight and you see some of this stuff, if you don't understand how deeply ingrained that shit can be when it's undealt with, I will say this for those of you that don't, I'm, I'm going to bet what I'm saying is not new to a lot of people that listen to this show. However, there may be some of you listening that don't know this saving private Ryan. Okay. It's a movie, right? It's probably one of the greatest world war two movies ever made. Right. It's, like Panda Brothers is the only thing I could say that probably does a better job, but that's, you know, 10 hours worth of a TV series versus Saving Private Ryan being, you know, one movie. But Saving Private Ryan is a great World War II movie. And Steven Spielberg deliberately paid loving, careful attention to the Normandy landing and made it really, really graphic, realistic, to the point where when that movie came out, there were still a lot of World War II veterans around. They went to see the movie and many of them, so many of them, in fact, got up and walked out of that scene of the Normandy invasion scene of the movie in general in literally tears, like broken that Steven Spielberg set up an 800 number hotline that veterans could call because when they came out of that movie, it brought up so much crap that they set up a hotline to help them process the trauma from going to see that movie. That's how strong that kind of unprocessed trauma can be. And guess what? All of those 70, 80 year old men that went to see saving private Ryan back in the day, none of them were mentally unstable. Well, not none of them, but I mean, they all had families. They all had lives. They all had jobs. They had all been semi-productive members of society for the most part up until that point. But they were carrying around this grenade in their stomach. And that movie just pulled the pin. So if you don't understand how PTSD works or if you're struggling with it, just understand that that trigger pulls the pin on that grenade. It doesn't mean you're mentally unstable. It just means that you need to deal with your shit before it blows up in your stomach. I guess this is the best way to put it. I don't know. Right. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, I, adding on to that, uh, I know I was just horrible with mine. You know, I thought it was, it was cliche to say, you know, I'm, I'm suffering with this. First, I didn't even know what it was until I kind of went to my, my doctor and they found, you know, I was having high blood pressure issues, anxiety issues, breathing issues. And uh, after talking to them after a while, that's kind of the path we went down. And um, they, they wanted me to go to obviously counseling that kind of helped me out a bit. Talking to a lot of people on the job help helps out tremendously. And then they, they offered like an eye movement desensitization reprocessing. Oh yeah. Yeah. I've heard about this. I I've been interested in it and we've had a couple of people that have had it and they say it's amazing. Oh yeah, that's what I hear. I I was too stubborn to to take that route, and not, and like I know you mentioned this about your listeners about what you know paying attention to this, but I would I I I was so stupid about treating myself or not treating myself or ignoring things, you know. And and you got to pay attention to that. You got to take care of yourself. You can't take care of anybody else unless you're taking care of yourself. And I just did a horrible job at it. And luckily, I I somehow got to a spot where I could I still have those memories and those thoughts but they're in the back of my mind where I place them, you know, and I can, I can bring them out, but they're always going to be there. Right. Yeah. Well, right. now does your book, it, it goes through the whole portion with, you know, you get to know who your grandfather is and it tells his story, but does it tell a story when he, once he gets home? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It t- it talks so it's about- that full circle type of thing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I got to elaborate on on a lot of things that we just had no idea about. Like he he worked, uh, he chauffeured mafia clients from Chicago to Las Vegas. He invested in a casino out there, like the uh-huh. Thunderbird Hotel, way back in the sixties, maybe early seventies or something like that. But he's he was flying planes like DC tens out of Chicago and transporting a lot of mafia clientele. <laughs> kind of crazy. Yeah, that's wild. Now, does it speak to his like? Do you touch on like post-traumatic stress and stuff in there? Yeah, for sure. Um, that was something I, I kind of wanted to be very cautious about writing about that, you know, because speaking to my mother and my uncles, that's that's a really personal 
right. experience they went through, you know, and, and they knew about his night terrors and him being physical with them at times or being right. distant. And uh, so I, I wanted to touch on that, hopefully, because it's important, obviously, but hopefully I did that respectful enough and, and uh, does justice to that, that part of his life. So we would be remiss if we didn't just make sure we got you to say, what's the title of your book? <laughs> <laughs> We've gone this whole way. And we <laughs> no, that's, that's great. Uh, it's called uh, Of Good Courage, and it's actually just from a Bible. For a Bible oh, yeah. Uh huh. So, okay. Yeah. I know that. I know that. Yeah. Passage. Well, mm-hmm. I did a Juana's every Wednesday for years, but my brother. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. For those of you who don't know, it doesn't matter, but I'm guessing Justin knows exactly what a Juana is. <laughs> no, I don't. Oh, really? Oh, no. it's a church youth group, like for teenagers, where they. Isn't that horse thing? You know, it's like Boy Scouts, but you memorize Bible verses and shit. So, anyway. We, we have one right down the street from our house. A Juana? Yeah, yeah. They usually have them at churches on Wednesday night. Kids get to go and hang out yeah. and do like you know, keeps you off the street and off drugs. Let's put it that way. Yeah. So that's awesome. But uh, where so can we find this book? Of good courage. Yeah, where do they get it? Yeah, so it's on Amazon right now. It's Amazon Kindle as well. I'm trying to get the uh, Audible version done. That's going to be a little process, but it just came out on September first. Who do you have reading uh, it? Uh, like who, customer wise. No, who do you have that's willing to read it as an audiobook? Oh, Are you gonna uh, read it? I no, I, I hate my voice. I couldn't well I couldn't stand that, you know. You you can absolutely email me because for a project like this, I'll be more than willing to to if you if you're if you want to discuss having us read, I'll be I'll be more than willing to discuss with you reading it. I would love that. That means a lot. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um well, so uh we, we can get it on Amazon. Do you have a website? Uh just a Facebook page. Uh, okay of good courage book uh so, you know you can punch that into facebook um and uh and it comes up there it has a lot of additional information supplemental pictures and all sorts of stuff on there and uh yeah so that's where it's at great well we appreciate you coming on chuck i know you uh we talked about dedications so i would like justin for you to obviously take this occasion to dedicate this to your grandfather because i know um we've talked a bit about him yeah, for sure. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, yeah, so just taking a moment to honor the the memory and sacrifices of uh, Merle D. Green. And uh, yeah, just a shout out to you guys. All right. And uh, Chuck, you also have our, our episode dedication. Yes. Um, this is uh, for Tyrell Owens Riley. Master Police Officer Tyrell Owens Riley suffered a fatal heart attack while participating in the physical fitness training portion of the department's SWAT team assessment. He was transported to Providence Hospital after exhibiting symptoms of a heart attack. Once at the hospital, he suffered a cardiac arrest. It could not be revived. Officer Owens Riley was a U.S. Marine Corps veteran. He had served with the Columbia Police Department for over seven years and was assigned to the Metro region. So that's a good stark reminder for all those cops out there and firefighters and anybody in you know especially military as well go get your heart checked it is a silent killer and mm-hmm. it will kill you when you least expect it i know where i was working and in the system that i was in uh back and heart if you'd been on the job for longer than five years back and heart were presumptive work related yeah. so that's that's how bad, I mean, the adrenaline causing scar tissue on the, on the arterial wall, on the heart wall. Like it's this job. I mean, the job is awesome. What it does to you sucks, Right. So For sure. <laughs> Justin, we appreciate you coming on, man. Um, you got to come back uh, when we can just swap some, some fun stories. Yeah, for sure. I'd love, I mean, I, I love talking about, don't get me wrong. I love talking about, you know generational trauma and grandparents because you know (laughs) that's who doesn't really yeah Yeah. (laughs) it's uh, it's uh, you know what though i i hate to say it but you know you get through this every time we do an episode like this or every time we talk about trauma every time we talk about you know grandparents you know it 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 really it really is helpful for in, in on so many levels i mean like i said my you know my grandfather to my to my mother wasn't the greatest of people and she had a hard time processing how sad she was when he passed because he was such a bastard Mm. um and 
in having the job I've had and in doing this show, it has really been helpful in me sitting with her and having long, you know, late night chats to kind of explain not just who she didn't understand that he was, but also to help her understand her own trauma and pain of pining for a man that for many of her younger formative years was a complete fuck twat. You know, <laughs> he, he, he was, he was hurting for sure. So I, 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 as much as we joke about how these episodes are, you know, tough to do, they're, they're very important. So I we appreciate sure. you coming on. Hey, thank you guys for, for doing that and all, acknowledging that and spending time on that. And you know, obviously dear to my heart. So thank you for that. Yeah. yeah I mean, well, thank you. Any this. Okay. So military service, fire service and police service are very much generational professions. And if, if anybody doesn't understand that, you just got to look at how many people are like, yeah, my dad was in the military. My, my grandfather's in the military or my dad was a cop. My grandfather was a cop or yeah, my dad was a firefighter. His dad was a firefighter. Like it is a lot. It is a very much just like anything else, like construction or like, you know, it's a generational trade. And when you're raised with it, you are attracted to it. And sometimes not only is that a good thing because you pass on experience and wisdom and, and job skills, but you also pass on trauma because that trauma gets brought home as a child from the parent. And then you bring it to the job and then, you know, maybe you don't cope with it so well. So I, I think generate talking about these kinds of things is, is important. Yeah, for so. sure. For those of you who go who yeah. out there who were raised by a veteran and became a veteran or raised by a cop and became a cop or raised by a firefighter and became a firefighter, go home and hug your dad and be like, it's all right. I get it. Why you came home and yelled at me that one time and gave me a backhand maybe than when I didn't deserve it. And just, you know, if you see me doing that myself, can you please just tell me? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, uh, I guess I, that I'm, means go home and say you're sorry or, or you forgive them. Yeah. All right. Hey, Tom, Chuck, uh, I, I hate to do one, one little quick thing. Uh, uh, no, another shameless sure. plug, uh, plug it. but, but talking on uh, about this. Um, so I'd like, uh, if any active military or any veterans are interested in this, if you could email me that, uh, can I give the email address? Is that you absolutely can. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's easy. It's I mean, it's your funeral website. when you give out an email address on this show. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the, the quality of, people and listeners <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no uh so it's of good courage book at gmail.com and if you uh, send me an email if you're interested in the story i'd love to send out a free ebook version to you uh absolutely free uh just Bam. as like a little nod war stories listeners yeah. boom free there gift you there you go just like magic poof absolutely all right well we appreciate you coming on justin Chuck, do you want to take us out? I know you've, yeah. you've, you've, we've got a spiel we give just so everybody is aware. Yeah. Well, thank you all today for listening. If you like today's podcast, please go follow us on our Instagram at war underscore stories underscore official and our Facebook at war stories podcast. If you already follow us and share our posts and our info, you can go on to link in our bio on Instagram and Facebook to reach all of our socials, our media and our website. Our podcast is on all major streaming podcast platforms, as well as on YouTube. If you want to support us, please go to our website at www.warstoriesofficial.com. Grab some gear. Um, we're going to have that, that tank top um, being released very, very shortly. Um, so just waiting on for it to be shipped now. Um, if you want to be featured on a show or you think you have a story and you want to share your story, please go to booking.warstories at gmail.com. Again, that is booking.warstories at gmail.com and send me your story and I can get you booked. We are looking for law enforcement, corrections, dispatchers, fire, medics, and veterans. If you have a friend who you think would be a great fit, let them know about us and give them our booking email. And if you've already been featured on the show and you want to come back on and share, uh, don't wait for me to get reach back out to you please just re-email me um doesn't matter when you came on if you if you were on a long time ago or you know recently reach back out um and let me know what you want to share and um and then we can get you booked again thank you for the support and stay safe and uh until our next episode come home with your shield or honor